Welcome. I'm going to present a paper, Public Employment Redux, joint work with Pietro Garibaldi and Teptida Sofazo. And um, I've been working for more than 10 years on, on public employment. Uh, and I think it's just a uh, very, very important uh, topic. So from the labor market perspective, between 15 to 30 percent of total employment in development economies is public sector employment and it represents the large majority of um, of government consumption so for instance the u.s government spends 60 percent more on compensation of general government employees than on such cases of intermediate goods uh, and and services so the usual g that macroeconomists consider is is actually most of it is the the public sector wage bill now, uh, so I've, I've been studying uh, public sector employment for, for, a, for a long time. This particular paper is about one of this uh, stylized facts that um, uh, so public employment is very heterogeneous along various dimensions, one of them being uh, education. So uh, this graph shows us the share of public sector employment um, out of employment in different education categories. And what we can see, this is for the US, uh, the government hires very few call, uh, workers with lower education, and it just progressively increases. And out of all master uh, workers with master or a PhD, about one third of them work in the uh, for the government. And uh, this paper is all about trying to understand why. Now, uh, before I'll tell you my um, the different possibilities or the different uh, factors that might play a role, uh, say that when you when you study public sector employment and wages, you can't never distinguish or you, you uh, the, the two dimensions go hand in hand. The the dimension of employment, so the quantities, the headcount, and then the other is the wage how much they're paid and obviously these two are uh, in interconnected so um when we we look at the public sector wage premium this is estimated from microdata after controlling for observable characteristics for different uh, education groups uh, either accounting for selection or not uh, the picture is always the same is that there is a wage compression ac across education groups where uh, the people with lowest education that have a higher premium of working in the public sector relative to the private and at the very top um, uh, usually a low or sometimes negative and substantial premium. Then depends how you define the education categories. But um, this is also one of the uh, main stylized facts. It's somehow surprising I, I, when I present uh, in this type of setting, uh, most of papers on public sector wage premium the, estimate a, a positive premium. Um, but uh, some of my audience, uh, it's sometimes skeptical exactly because they are in this last category, the ones that uh, who, um, working for the public sector comes at the wage penalty. Okay, so the objective of the paper is just to understand uh, why does the government hire so many educated workers? And um, in, in a way, the first instinct of many people is to say, oh, this is, is, is great to have um, the more educated working in the, in the government. But from a macroeconomic perspective, you, you have to see that one extra worker, uh, educated work in the public sector is one fewer worker in the private. So what it means is that the skill mix uh, that the public sector has, it, it has uh, one effect, um, uh, at least in the, uh, initially on the skill mix in the uh, in the private so um, so it's just important to understand why does the government hire and the first explanation I presume it's the one that naturally comes across in everyone's mind it's just whatever the goods and services the government provides it needs more educated workers so we can think about uh, technology uh, so coming back to the what does the government produces and what's what's the input that it requires so we know the government produces um uh, to a great extent healthcare education or uh, bureaucracy 
uh, maintaining the judiciary system and all this requires more educated workers. And this is kind of the baseline explanation. It's very benign, uh, benign and uh, it's just uh, the, the starting point. Now, we think there's two other elements that can play a role. The first one is this, uh, the, the fact that wages are compressed uh, that we've seen before. And when it translates into the choice of which workers to hire, uh, if wages are too com very compressed, it's going to shift demand from the relative more expensive, less qualified workers. So the workers at the bottom that are relatively more expensive, so the, the governments or different departments within the government uh, will hire fewer those and substitutes towards the more qualified workers. And um, uh, in, in, in that case, the, the skill mix uh, is biased because of this compressed wage schedule towards the more educated. And then the third explanation is one of um, under, underemployment. So uh, it has different names in the literature, underemployment or overeducation. It's basically the idea that you have people that have a college degree that are working in unskilled occupations. So occupations require uh, lower, uh, lower qualifications. And this might rise if, in fact, the government pays so well, uh, pays very well to this uh, low occupations, uh, low skilled occupations, then they might attract workers with more uh, occupations. So this, uh, Pietro calls them the, um, the, 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 the college, uh, the college, uh, the janitor with a college degree, and Tepti the calls the the, uh, the PhD barista. Um, now uh, we think that uh, because how the government uh, sets the uh, usually hires, um, uh, it's and the fact that it pays more to this uh, unqualified jobs. Uh, will show that actually underemployment is more perverse in the in the in the public sector. So hence, this could contribute uh, the fact saying that the government hires many educated workers, but they are actually working in un unskilled uh, unskilled occupations. So the primary objective of this paper is try to distinguish uh, between these uh, these explanations. Um, now, what we do. We first uh, document empirical evidence for the US, UK, France, and Spain using microdata on both the main facts, so the fact that there is this uh, education bias along different dimensions, um, and then these three possible explanations. So we'll show that the public education bias also exists within industry and within narrow defined occupation within the public sector, meaning that this idea of technology or the type of goods it provides, it's not the only explanation. And, and I'll, we'll document this public uh, private wage differentials and the underemployment of, of college graduates. Then we develop a simple two sector model with an under, uh, underemployment. And um, we, uh, in, in this paper, the idea is really try to simplify and, and get to uh, what is the essence of what we think the, the, the public, uh, the essence of the public sector labor markets. Um, and the, the idea is that the private sector, we think about it as a competitive labor market or Valrasian. The public sector, we'll, we will think it's driven by a cost minimizing government that um, acts with a wage, wage schedule that does not equate demand and supply. And we call it a malleable government. So what this, uh, this means, um, we don't think that the, the same com competitive forces that drive our region private sector market exist in the public sector. And this is for two reasons. So one is the fact that you don't have another government. If the government is paying too much, um, th there won't be another government coming in and undercutting, uh, undercutting prices because there are no prices. The government um, doesn't sell the good, it finances with, with taxation. And so because of that, we don't think the, um, the Valrasian auctioneer is, is there. And uh, it's, we view the wages not so much as a price 
that adjusts endogenously to equate demand and supply, but as a policy variable. And this is strongly grounded in the, the theories that from the 60s, 70s and 80s, for which Buchanan or Musgrave or uh, Becker uh, or Alessina contributed, showing that, uh, arguing that the government uses the wage policies to achieve many other targets, to satisfy unions, to win elections, uh, to redistribute resources. So to do all uh, a bunch of things that are exogenous to the labor market. Now, this paper is really about if the wage is not um, a market clearing wage, what are the implications in the, in the, in the labor market? And here, there are two uh, two uh, possible implications. If the wages do not clear, um, are not there to, to clear the markets, then they either are high. And in that case, if the wages are high, there's many people that want to work for the government more than the number of vacancies or the number of jobs. So employment is the, ten, the, ten, the, the man determined. It's the government that decides uh, how, many, uh, how many to hire. On the other hand, if the public wages are low, then employment is supply determined. What, what it means, the government wants to hire 10 people, but only five are willing to work for the government at that, that wage. And we think this captures the essence of the public sector labor market um, that either uh, in some countries or for some groups of uh, public sector workers, the wages are too high. And basically you have uh, some type of queues for the public sector. But uh, on the other hand, if some workers, or for some countries, wages might be too low, and then the government can't recruit uh, enough workers or enough of some types of workers. So uh, this is the, the key feature. You'll see the model will be very simple, ends up being uh, one equation to one unknown. Now, how we introduce underemployment, um, we, we think that jobs are described think about a ladder type mechanism in which workers with high education can perf perform skilled jobs, but they can also prefer, uh, perform unskilled jobs. And workers with low education uh, cannot, cannot perform skilled jobs. So it's just uh, how we set up the technologies allowing uh, high educated workers to perform unskilled jobs. And then we set up a variation of a Roy model in which people have a different value or you think about costs for different types of jobs and sectors. And, and the fact that they have this idiosyncratic uh, cost or, or value, uh, it uh, will make some people choose to be underemployed um, and it will also allow different wages in the public and private sector. So, um, this is the model, and I'll just overview the, the, the main quantitative results. Um, and it's most of the, the driver of um, the education bias is technology, but the wages and excess and unemployment ex explain 12 to 15% of the education bias. So it's still, uh, it's still, uh, still important. Now, the second implication, I think it's very important from a policy point of view, and it's one of those results that is not uh, obvious at all. So it's when you think about the public sector wage and, and inequality, so the college premium. So what we find is that when you increase the unskilled public sector wages, so you try to reduce inequality in the public sector, what happens? Well these these unskilled workers become more expensive so the government shies away from hiring them and hires more skilled workers and and what uh, so they take off skilled workers from the private sector they they are more unskilled workers going to the private sector and what happens it's just the wages of the unskilled go down and the wages of the skilled go go up and so actually it increases inequality in the private sector so lower inequality for the public sector workers will actually have an effect through general equilibrium in raising the wages in the um, raising inequality in the private sector wages and we think this is um, this is a very important uh, and it's not an obvious result now i'm going to skip most of the literature most of the recent literature in the such in matching frictions uh, for which I've, I've been working for for ten years, as I mentioned, uh, they uh, so they model the the such and matching frictions. Now, 
uh, they can they can study things like the role of public sector job security, the value of job security, um, the effect on the on on, on bargaining and uh, effects on unemployment. Now we uh, so I've written a lot for this literature. So. Uh, um, but we think that for our purpose to understand the implications of some of the implications, it's probably uh, more clearly studied without search and employment. And then it's mainly the effects in general equilibrium and the interactions in general equilibrium that are much uh, uh, easier to understand if uh, if you abstract from search, uh, search and employment. So the model won't have unemployment, it will have underemployment. Uh, which is uh, uh, a different a different thing, although the words similar. Um, uh, we also uh, contribute in a way to the fixed price equilibrium literature. So this was the literature in the 70s, how it was usually motivated to think about unemployment rationing, uh, unemployment when before search 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 and matching frictions, and and uh, it kind of it came out in these views, but we do think that a fixed price uh, literature, the fixed price equilibrium, actually uh, is a very good description of the public sector rather than the private. And what we do is analyze the coexistence of this Valrasian market that uh, clears uh, to equate the demand and supply in the private sector with this fixed price um, uh, variation of the labor market in the public. Now there's four more related papers, so I'll I'll I'll, I'll jump to go uh, straight into the facts, and uh, we do uh, just to 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 think about the problem. Um, we are going to just summarize everything in two categories: college and non-college. So skilled, unskilled, uh, and it's it's uh, or educated. Um, high education, low education, and it, when we match it to the date, it's going to be college and non-college. And you can think that the total fraction n of the population have college, fraction 1 minus n uh, does not have college, and these are the number of workers employed in the private and public. Um, now, we'll create two statistics that reflect this bias, and we'll, um, you can do it by row or by column. So we call the ratio of public employment shares as the share of public employment for college divided um, uh, by the share of public employment in no college. Uh, and the education intensity is the, the, sh uh, the share of public, uh, of, col uh, of public sector workers that have college divided by the share of private sector workers that have college. Either way, in the symmetric world, uh, this, this ratio should be equal to one. If there was a, a this uh, a perfect a perfect symmetry. Now we go to data to micro data, so from France, Spain, UK, the labor force survey, and the CPS for the US. And this is what we can see: the the public sector employment share by education, and 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 you see this uh, symmetry. So in UK, for instance, 37% of college graduates are working in the public sector. And 17% of workers with lower uh, edu uh, lower education are working in the public sector, and um, it's probably the symmetry is even more noticed in in in, in Spain. Uh, so the flip coin is this: the college employment share by sector. Uh, so the public sector you, you see in UK, Spain, and the US, the majority of public sector workers uh, have a college, at least a college degree. So our two statistics are just the ratio between the two. Um, and uh, and here they are, and you can see they are all above one naturally, and and around uh, two in the UK and US, higher in Spain and slightly uh, smaller uh, in in France. And what we do in the paper, we just show uh, these statistics uh, divided by by gender, by age, by by state. This is particularly interesting in the US, where it 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 can vary a lot. Uh, this ratio of public employment shares from 1.4 to, to 3, um, and also by 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 time. Um, now, we want to think about these three uh, explanations, and one is thinking about the services that the government provides, and uh, one natural approach is just to uh, disentangle 
all what is uh, different industries, in particular uh, education, health, um, education and health. So you see here, for instance, in education, um, uh, the public employment shares are around 80%. So 80% of uh, people employed in the industry education are working for the public sector. In the UK, is about 50%. But what you notice is that even within these education, there is this public sector education bias, as you can see on the on the right hand side on our, our statistics. And when you remove those um, those industries, uh, you still have um, is here UK rest or US rest or France rest, you still have uh, a, a bias. It's much, it's smaller, so which indicates that this composition is important, uh, but there is still something, uh, something there. And another way to see it is um, when we go to three digit occupations. So we go to the US and to go to three digit occupations that um, I'll have some example later on. Um, that are common between public and private sector. So this could be cleaners, office cleaners. Um, and uh, what we find is that more than two thirds of the occupations and within the occupation, you have a higher uh, an, uh, education bias. The government hires proportionally more college, college workers. Um, now, the, the wage compression, there are pretty much every paper that estimates the public sector wage premium does the same for different education groups, and this wage compression is always there. We run regressions for the CPS um, just to get some numbers that we later use in the calibration, and it's about 8% at the bottom uh, for people with no college and 1% for people with at least a college. Bear in mind that there's still this even more heterogeneity within, but but because we'll match the, the model, we'll only have two types of workers, we will match these numbers. Um, ourselves, we, we estimate this for other countries using the structure of earnings survey, and it's always uh, the premium for workers without college is always, uh, always, always higher. And uh, we also do this measure of, of wage compression uh, for different uh, uh, states in the US and except one, um, uh, it's um, it's all, um, uh, it's, it's, there's always this wage, wage compression and, it, but it also varies a lot across different, different states. Now, uh, coming to the evidence on unemployment, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to start with just some anecdotal evidence, and this I took, it's a newspaper article that I took from this paper by uh, Jerome Carlos and Cospetaridis, Cospetaris 20. Uh, it's, it's a very nice paper, and, and I love this, uh, this quote, so I've, 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 been, uh, I've, I've been using them, uh, the quote, because I, I do think it's, it's uh, so it says, Italy's chronic unemployment problem has been thrown into sharp relief after 85,000 people applied for 30 jobs at the bank, the Bank of Italy. The work is not glamorous. One duty is feeding cash into machines that can distinguish banknotes that are counterfeit or so worn out that they should no longer be in circulation. The Bank of Italy whittled down the applicants to a short list of 8,000, all of them first-class graduates with a solid academic record behind them. They will have to sit in grueling examination in which they will be tested on statistics, mathematics, economics, and English. The high level of interest uh, was a reflection of the state of the economy, but also of the Italian obsession with securing a permanent job. So uh, this hints uh, at, at many things. One of these is this idea of uh, under, underemployment, that these jobs are so valuable. Um, so there, there is a wage component. There is also this security component that I look at other, in other papers with such frictions. I won't focus now, but we can talk about it later. But it's just they offer um, so attractive jobs that they attract people uh, that have much, much higher qualifications than what's needed for the, 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 the post. And this is the idea of employment. Now, already in the US, you can see some evidence. So here I plot for all these small, narrow occupations. Um, 
for all these narrow occupations, I calculate the ratio of public employment shares. So it's our measure of, of verification bias. And I'll, I'll plot it against the, the, the wage premium uh, of uh, no college workers. So this is the average worker in the public, uh, without college in the public sector, how, how much it earns than the worker uh, with no college in that occupation in the private sector. And you see the higher this no college public sector wage premium, meaning the more the government pays relative to the private sector, then uh, more educated it, uh, it hires. And this we are talking about narrow. Uh, so this will be uh, office cleaners, uh, food related product machine operators, mobile plant operators. It's 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 something very uh, very narrow, but we go we 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 go to a bit a bit more detail um, with PIAC data. But before we, we have to do some just some uh, concepts and definitions that will help us also in the model. So think about you as a stock of workers with college employed in jobs typically done by non-college workers. So this is our under our underemployed. Uh, the N is still the stock of employed college workers. And now we have to distinguish and separate what is the job and what is the worker. So J1 is the stock of jobs in graduate re related tasks. So we can call them skilled jobs that are only filled by graduates, but not all graduates because some will be an, uh, underemployed. And J2 is the stock in non-graduate related tasks. And um, these would be either the no college workers or the, the college that are underemployed. So we'll define the underemployment rate as the fraction of these unskilled jobs that are filled in by college graduates, because it's a, a natural way in which we can have the underemployment rate uh, in both public and uh, private. Now, um, we go to PIAC data. So this is the main um, uh, data set that uh, the OECD has been using to study underemployment. And uh, we uh, we basically follow the OECD methodologies. We also have uh, two additional methodologies to calculate under underemployment, but it's 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 basically looking at uh, which occupations are uh, these people working two digits um, either by one or two digits and then uh, seeing uh particular workers their own qualifications uh if they are if they say they are well matched and if they are don't say well matched then uh they underemployed if their education is much higher um above 1.96 standard deviations within the occupation above the the the, the average uh, number of years of, of schooling but we have uh, we actually have three other definitions and in all of them um the results are very similar. Uh, there is substantial underemployment rate. This is already documented by the OECD. Um, but uh, when we look at the public and private, it's for most countries, for let's say 70% of countries, it's it's much higher in the public. And these are particularly Italy, Spain, um, uh, Greece, uh, and uh, less so in Nordic countries like Finland. Uh, France or or, uh, or Netherlands. So unemployment seems to be uh, more pervasive in the public sector, although it's not in, uh, inevitable. Um, okay. Um, so I hope I've persuaded you of these uh, of 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 these facts, and now we'll try to think about them together in in a model. A two sector model with uh, underemployment. Now, the model is going to be very, very uh, simple. Um, and uh, we, we start with just a basic, you know, labor economics 101 model with two types of uh, workers, let's say educated uh, uh, college and non college. As a fraction has college, a fraction one minus n doesn't have college. And the basic model, you have this one to one mapping between the, 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 the education of the worker and the skill of the job. And you have jobs uh, called J1 uh, that are skilled and J2 that are unskilled. Uh, and this, uh, this is the usual model. Now, 
uh, we are going to generalize this in two dimensions. So one is to have this second sector, that's the public sector, uh, that also have skilled uh, jobs, J1G and J2G for unskilled jobs. And the difference is that uh, the, the, the wage setting process is different. So in the private sector, it will be a Valrhesian market in which the wages are going to adjust to create demand and supply. And in the public sector, these wages are determined outside the labor market and they do not adjust to equate demand and supply. So this is the first generalization is adding the, the public sector in this particular form. The second generalization is adding underemployment. And here is just uh, the idea that um, uh, technology itself allows skilled workers, educated workers to do one skilled job. And it's just, uh, it's technological feasible. It's not, we assume that it's not the other way around. So uh, I've uh, worked in the hotel serving breakfast uh, many, many years ago. I could still do that job. Uh, now, if I wanted, it's feasible, it's in my possibility set. Uh, the opposite is not true. So the cook at the, at the hotel, he can't come to Birkbeck and give um, and give my my lectures. And so we studied this only in the private sector, a bit uh, more developed model with also over, over, over allowing for overemployment and different wages. But in this particular setting, to keep it simple, we just allow to be uh, underemployed. Now a different question is why would someone choose to be underemployed? but that will come in a sec. Uh, so this is the, the final, the, the possibilities. If you are skilled, uh, if you are educated, you have four choices, public, private, in a skilled or unskilled job. And if you are an unskilled worker, only public or, or private. These are the choice set now that we'll see how workers choose. So the technologies, there will be a production for private sector goods and the production of a public sector goods, but these are different goods. And so private sector for TV, public sector produces bureaucracy. There's no market price for public sector services. Now, in terms of technology, we allow, we'll just uh, assume Cobb Douglas, we, we do an example with this TES, but it, it's not really um, important for the argument. Um, um, the, we assume that this weights, beta and alpha, are different, and this would be reflected on this, you know, the different good that the government produces, so B could be larger than, than alpha, and if it requires more, uh, more educated workers. So one and two refers to the skill of the job or the education of the worker, and X, P and G, private sector, and G for public sector. So it's a static model, and here we have a pecuniary and a non-pecuniary value of a job. So the job gives you a certain wage, and uh, there's an income tax, so part of that goes away to finance public employment. Um, then you have another part, uh, another, uh, we call it non-pecuniary value, you can think about both as a value or a cost. Uh, it's uh, something idiosyncratic uh, that are taken from an extreme type of uh, error distribution that has mean zero and nu is the weight on this non-pecuniary cost. Uh, it has mean zero, but it just it can be negative, so it can be a cost. So it can be, for example, um, uh, you know, the high type job is in another city and I would have to move. Uh, so a particularly skilled job in the private sector, it's going to be very costly. Uh, or it can be also a value, an intrinsic value, uh, but it's something that's not, um, so it's the value of job security or the value of public sector pensions that affect everyone is really syncretic. So it's really, um, now we can think of either as a value or as a cost. And uh, so we, we don't make any normative statements and um, we just, uh, there's no normative statement. This is a purely positive uh, model. Uh, so you can think about it as, as, as wedges, let's say. Um, if new goes to zero, then this component disappears, this wedge, and the workers always select the highest paying job. And then we go back to our usual world. So in that case, uh, as long as 
sector was a tiny difference between wages of skilled jobs, no worker would want to be underemployed. But um, uh, with the new positive, then there is always this component that can overcome wage differences um, between two different jobs. So I might choose to go into um, in low paying job because the high paying job has a big cost, so it's outside. And I do have uh, a really passion, I like my co-workers in this uh, lower paying, paying job. Um, so the, the, the double objective of this is allow for uh, wage differentials across public and private sector and uh, to actually allow for underemployment. And we chose the extreme type of narrow distribution. So if you remember your, your econometrics, it's uh, the multinomial logic model. And because it just gives analytical solutions, the difference between two extreme type of errors is as a logistic distribution. Okay, so the valuation public sector is just 101 labor economics, it's just wage equals the marginal product. In, um, so it's going to depend on the ratio of, of skilled to unskilled employment um, in the private sector. Now, in the government, we think the government, uh, we set it up as needing to produce a minimum level of government services, GBAR, and um, it doesn't sell the services uh, and it finances the wage bill with lump sum or income tax. Um, public sector wages, W1 and W2, G, are taken as exogenous, so we think about them as, as policy variables. Um, it's not really about being, it's, it's being exogenous to the labor market. Uh, we could, uh, we have an appendix, uh, a way to formalize uh, endogenous public sector wages, but where wages are the, partly determined by the weight of, of unions, but you can have different models. Uh, the idea is that they come from outside uh, the, the labor market. Uh, they are not, uh, they are to equate demand and, and supply. Uh, so given this, the, what the government chooses is just the level and the composition, the skill mix of employment. So that's really what the model is about, is just the choice of do I want to hire sk very skilled workers or more unskilled, uh, unskilled workers. And it will do so to minimize the cost of producing. Now, uh, he here, given a certain wages, uh, the government is going to solve this unconstrained problem. What's this unconstrained problem is uh, what's the, the optimal number of workers that the government would want. And it's just minimizing costs subject to maintaining a certain production. And you have these two uh, fertility conditions that would tell you the demand for high skilled workers and the demand for uh, uh, unskilled workers. Um, and uh, this is the, the, the demand. Um, and there's the market clearing uh, that is, as, as, as before, uh, that all college workers would all be employed in skilled or unskilled or will be underemployed in the public or the, or the private. And the, the model is now the, the sorting, um, it's the supply side of the market. Uh, so we've seen how the government determines how many workers it wants, but now the question is what do workers want to do? And workers have, skilled workers have, educated workers have four choices. Either go to the private, um, to the public in skilled jobs, or to be underemployed in the public or the private. And here the assumption is um, if a skilled worker goes uh, to be un underemployed in the public, it would, he would always get a job. If it goes for a skilled job, uh, it really depends. Um, he uh, he might get a job, but if there are too many people competing, then he might not get a job, and uh, he won't get his first option. So this is the unconstrained first choice of workers, and uh, we are going to allow for different wages in the public sector uh, and underemployment. Um, so what happens is the government pays very high wages. Too many people have a first choice of working in the public sector for skilled jobs, more than the number of jobs. So this is, means that the jobs are ration, demand determines J, uh, JG1, the number of public sector skilled workers. What happens to the other workers? Well, 
they don't get their first choice, they'll go to get their uh, second choice. If the wages are low, then few workers want to join the government, less than the number of jobs, and it is supply that determines uh, uh, JG1. Um, and it's this type of rationing and quantity restrictions that are common in non valuation markets. Here, uh, in contrast with these other uh, models where there is unemployment, if, if there is rationing, uh, there, the people are unemployed, uh, here, the alternative, they always have the private sector, so it'll never be unemployment per se. And so the first choice and then this, the, the actual number of public sector workers will just be the minimum of the two. Uh, this is this idea, either you'll be in one world or, or the other. For the low skilled workers, there's only two choices, but the, the same idea applies. So now they can only skilled or unskilled jobs and um, there will be a supply for the public sector unskilled jobs and it will be rationed if there are too many relative to the, the workers. Now, what is uh, what we can do is define what would be for a given uh, wage policy and demand for government jobs we can define uh, what would be a market clearing wage, the threshold wage that would allow the government to achieve that level of employment. And this is defined like this. So higher, this is the threshold for skilled and unskilled wages that would, uh, uh, above the government is unconstrained, the, uh, below the government uh, would not be able to hire the, 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 the workers he, he wanted. And, Okay, so what's what generates is different for four types of, of regimes, and maybe you can see them. But in this graph, this is for the, the quantitative. So, uh, skilled wages in the public sector on the y-axis and unskilled public sector wages on the x-axis, and um, regime one is the regime where wages are high enough and the government. Uh, always hires the number of workers it wants. It's unconstrained, it's paying too much. Uh, it has too many people wanting to go to the public sector. On the other hand, if you are, um, if the skilled wages are very low, then you move to regime number two, which is one where the government is not paying uh, high wages at the top. Uh, so it's hiring fewer workers than would, uh, the, would want to minimize costs. So it's, it has to hire to maintain the production of goods and services, it hires more unskilled workers uh, to maintain production because it just can't hire enough uh, enough skilled uh, skilled workers. And then, if all the wages are uh, very low, then you move into regime four, which is this um, uh, the public sector breaks down, so the government can't hire. Uh, enough workers to produce this public sector good G G bar. Okay. Now, when we look at uh, underemployment, is going to have a very simple expression, and uh, underemployment in the public and private is just going to depend on wage differential. So it's uh, the higher the 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 wages at the bottom will just increase under underemployment. So the theory is very simple. On one hand you have this uh, non-pecuniary value or cost, um, but uh, on the other hand, you have the wage differentials. And so if the skilled and unskilled job pays exactly the same wage, if there were only two, you would, half of people would want to go um, uh, to these unskilled jobs. And now the bigger is the, is the difference, the, um, uh, the fewer people want to come. So if there is a you very, very big wage cost, if the wages are very, very low, then there will be very few uh, underemployment. So underemployment in the way is just uh, uh, occurs when the wage differentials are not too, too, too high. Now notice that in that case, in this case, when the wages in the, the, of unskilled workers in the public and private are exactly the same, then you wouldn't uh, you would have the same level of underemployment, but be, uh, because you have different size of sector, it will generate a different underemployment rate. So this is something when we go move to the quantitative uh, 
sec session uh, se uh, section it's not really uh, ideal so we'll change that in the in the in the quantitative model but for now this just allows a very very simple um, uh, solution to the model so just to wrap up uh, there's uh, eight endogenous variables so it's the wages in the private sector private sector skilled and unskilled jobs and the public sector skilled and jobs and the underemployment in the two sectors and the exogenous variable are the wages and all the param the other parameters related to preferences and, and technology so the model is really uh, very very simple in the regime one uh, it's it can be written easily in three equations to three unknowns and it, you can further substitute the wages to have just uh, solving one equation on an uh, underemployment uh, we show that the equilibrium exists and is unique and then what we do we can do a bunch of comparative uh, statics so in, in particular the one we are interested in this is to to, to show to prove that when the unskilled public sector wages go up um, so you are reducing the inequality in the public sector and you actually increase the inequality in the private sector and it's all because of this rearrangement of uh, you this public sector adjusts its, its skill mix so that feeds back into the private sector skill mix okay and um, we then do can do uh, elasticities and decompose this effect of the unskilled public sector wage on the private sector uh, by looking at the, the because it, it it's it's going to uh, absorb more skilled workers into the public sector uh, generating this shortage of skill in the private it's going to the government is going to hire fewer workers so there's going to be excess on skill to the private sector and then there's also an effect on uh, under uh, underemployment um, if the public sector pays very this very high wages at the bottom it's going to hire skilled skilled workers are are, are coming to do these jobs which reinforces this it uh, uh, puts more uh, unskilled in the private sector and and there's this shortage of of, of skilled and now in regime two uh, it's it, it's the opposite so the regime two is one where uh, the government is limited uh, in the number of skilled workers it hires because the wage is very low uh, and in that case there is a reversal of uh, many of the the signs of uh, the, the effects and here is while before this uh, increasing the wage the skilled wages when the, they are already high um, be, before um, it's it's uh, makes the government hire fewer workers uh, now allows workers to hire uh, to hire more skilled workers so it's just the opposite because uh, now here uh, the skilled public sector workers are driven by supply and not uh, and not and not demand so by completeness there's also regime three and regime four the regime four is that when the public sector breaks down and so so we can all characterize this different this different regime now in the quantitative part um it's when we try to bring it to the data now we we had this this issue that when the two wages were the same they were their symmetry there was an asymmetry in the underemployment rates just because the, the public sector is, is smaller than the private sector so here we do just a small change to the model it makes the, the the algebra more complicated in in when i solve it in the computer it doesn't matter but to do analytical results is, is, is less uh, uh, is less interesting. But it's just saying that um, uh, everyone, all workers have one opportunity to be underemployed. Uh, but it's uh, some some fraction of people have an underemployment opportunity in the public sector, and a fraction another fraction has an under, underemployment opportunity in the private sector. And it's uh, just this that uh, we need to uh, to generate this when the two wages there's perfect symmetry of wages in the two sector the underemployment rates are are the same. Okay, so we are going to calibrate the model to basically all these statistics that we've seen uh, in the first part that we get from the data. And you see the model is very simple. There's only seven parameters. 
and there is a one-to-one -one mapping to seven to seven targets uh, in the um, uh, that we get for the for the US. One thing we 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 use to 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 target this parameter new from the from the the sorting mechanism, the weight of the non-pecuniary cost or, or or values, uh, to target the underemployment rate in the economy because it's a one-to-one -one mapping because this is what uh, what generates underemployment. But it's not targeted the different employment rates in the public and in the private sector. And we get to match these ones, the ones from PIAC, very, very well with the, with the model. Uh, so we are, um, we, we, we do get a good fit on this asymmetry between the two, the two sectors. So what drives what we do, we have this uh, table with the public employment shares and the ratio and the education intensity and the ratio and the underemployment rate in the data that's very similar to the, to the baseline. And then we do just two, two exercises. First, we equate the public wages to the private wages. So we get rid of the wage compression and by definition, we get rid of differences in underemployment rates. Um, and we get uh, that between 10 and 15% of this uh, ed education bias, uh, it, it goes down by, by, uh, by 15%. Um, and when we equate wages and technology, then everything becomes becomes symmetric. And only equating wages would would go 15% along the way. So it it is um, the majority uh, a different a different good a, a different uh, technology, uh, but it's still quite 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 sizable. And the implications of this, we look at the implications on inequality. So it's this idea, this what's this elasticity of private wages with respect to unskilled wages, um, and and we see uh, you see that you increase the wages by one percent at the bottom, and it goes up by uh, zero point zero seven percent for the the top wages in the private sector, and it goes down for the the the, the bottom wages. So you are trying to reduce inequality in the public sector. You actually increase it in the in the private. Um, another interesting element is you increase the wages to all public sector workers and in, in practice in this model it shouldn't really generate because it wouldn't alter the skill mix but uh, it still affects the wages in the private sector because it affects uh, underemployment. Uh, so it's not because you, you change um, the skill mix that you want, but now because you are paying higher wages at the bottom, you'll generate more underemployment. So that pushes the wages in the private sector uh, of the skilled workers up uh, and it reduces those of the unskilled. Um, and this only because of the underemployment channel. Um, now I've, I've told you, I've, I've shown you this, uh, this uh, chart here with the regime. So the, the model is in regime one very comfortably. Um, but we, we do think this idea of regimes is, is, very, uh, is very relevant. And uh, here's a quote by Borjas, a paper in 2004. He documents these changes in the wage structure in the public and private sector. And he concluded that as the wage structure in the public sector becomes relatively more compressed, the, the public sector found it harder to attract and retain high skilled workers. So in short, the, the widening of the wage inequality in the private, together with a more relative stable distribution in the public sector, created these magnetic forces that altered the sorting of workers in the public sector, with high skilled workers becoming more likely to end up in the private sector. And um, and this idea in, in, in our model, because we only have college and college, uh, you don't, you don't, uh, we far we can show what happens when you cut skilled wages, and uh, we can see exactly when if you move on to the left with wage cuts, then uh, the government becomes really severely restricted in the ability of hiring skilled workers. Now, what we do, and we have it in the appendix, is um, a, a case with um, where we change the calibration to mimic more. Uh, PhD, we think about the skill level as workers with master or PhD. 
and there uh, we uh, we we are in the in the in the regime two in the in the US. So it's it's uh, it's going to, in the end it's really about different categories uh, or different countries or different points in time where you might be uh, uh, in regime two, and then because all the signs flip. Uh, then you'd really want to 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 think about your policy advice because it's it's uh, it's very different uh, the implications of policy whether you are in regime one or in regime uh, regime two. As, uh, this is it. So uh, this uh, uh, this were the main conclusions. Uh, it's uh, this this wage compression and excess unemployment matter are a driver of, of technology uh, of um, the, the the public sector education bias uh, and then the implications of, of this compression uh, are probably uh, the, the more important or interesting ones are the ones uh, that pertain to to inequality and that this idea that you protect um, inequality in the subset of workers um, it actually raises inequality in the in the private sector. So uh, inequality is something we should worry about. But thinking that you can protect a subgroup, it's like giving a a, a paracetamol to a cancer patient. Uh, yeah. It's uh, and in this case, it just makes uh, makes things uh, things. At the bottom line, it really my my call is for us to really think carefully about. The, the, how we set public sector wages and try to set it, uh, the wages in the, um, uh, to, to think more carefully about uh, setting the right public sector wages. So, um, well, thank you. Thank you very much.